or you can enter them in the chat box. But uh, thank you again for joining us. My name is Marcus Yates. I'm the Director of Graduate Admission here at Roger Williams. Uh, I'm just kind of your opening act here, but I appreciate you uh, coming for our School of Architecture, Art and Historic Preservation Information Session. I'm joined tonight by our Dean of the School of Architecture, Art and Historic Preservation, Steve White. So I appreciate your time, Steve. And uh, we're gonna give you a chance to hear from him. Uh, certainly the bulk of what you're gonna hear from will be from Steve tonight. And glad you have the opportunity to connect with him directly. And I think that speaks to one of the nice things that's about what Roger Williams is, but more specifically the School of Architecture that Steve and our Associate Dean, Greg Laramie do very well as they create a very personalized experience that even, even as a student in, uh, in our largest major and our largest school on campus, you have direct access to our deans and they care about you. They know you as a name and a face. And it's really about the community that they created in the School of Architecture. And, and certainly that's something that resonates with all of our students. So hopefully you get a sense of that tonight. Um, so very briefly, I'll just tell you a little bit about us in general. Uh, we're a small private university in Bristol, Rhode Island. We also have a satellite campus in Providence. The architecture program, as well as preservation practices and the related certificates are offered here on our main campus in Bristol. So that's a photo of our main campus there in Bristol. We're a nice location. I'll get into that in a minute. We're, we're about an hour from Boston, um, about two and a half hours from New York City. So we're in a great location between two major metropolitan areas for a lot of great opportunities for internships and work opportunities and so on. I know some of you are international, so we'll hopefully try to give you a sense of um, where we are uh, located in a second. We have about 4,000 or so undergraduate students um, and then about 750 graduate and law students. We're the only law school in Rhode Island. So we actually have a program that's kind of a sister program with the law school with preservation. So if you're interested in preservation practices, I know we've had some students uh, on the line interested in the preservation and JD opportunities. So you could be a lawyer and work in preservation law. There's a, great, a lot of great opportunities there. Um, certainly our architecture and preservation programs as well. One thing that our architecture programs and specifically the School of Architecture and Art and Historic Preservation focuses on is really that commitment to public good. That's something that we've stood for for as long as the university has been around. Uh, certainly our namesake, Roger Williams, was known for service and giving back and uh, the community in which we serve and freedom of religion and all those things that he stood for hundreds of years ago. And those are things that we've really continued along. And one of those things that Steve will talk about later on is our community partnership center where the architecture school was really where that was birthed. That came from interest in connecting our students to public opportunities, supporting our, our communities. And uh, there's not often opportunities for, whether it be municipal governments or nonprofits to fund major projects, but our students have been able to provide kind of professional consulting and support for work that's really been integral to growing the community around us. So that's something we've really been focused on here and it's, it's, it's been a great part of the experience that students have. So this is kind of an aerial shot of our campus looking south, uh, compared to Newport, Rhode Island. If you drive straight to about 25 minutes south over that bridge, you'd end up in Newport, Rhode Island, but a very pretty spot right on the water. So if you like a waterfront campus, you certainly wouldn't mind it here. Uh, but it's nice because you have that kind of smaller, more bucolic kind of campus that we have here, but we're close to a lot of major cities and career opportunities. So you have the best of both worlds. We're not a very remote area, but we're not smack in the middle of a city either. So you have the benefits of both sides of that coin. And that's really nice for the experience that we offer here. So as I mentioned, we're located right between Boston and New York City. And you see we're in blue over on the right side. So those of you, especially those of you international that aren't familiar, uh, with the states as much. Um, we're in the Northeast in New England, and I'll zoom in here a little bit, but you'll see our campus is right there where that yellow star is. Uh, and Boston's about an hour to our north. Uh, we've got Hartford almost due west of us, uh, a couple hours or so drive. Uh, New Haven, Connecticut, home of Yale, and a lot of great architecture and a lot of great firms down there. Uh, Greenwich, of course, Connecticut, Stanford, a lot of areas where a lot of major firms are located. And of course, New York City, about two and a half hours from us. We're convenient to airports, both in Providence and Boston. Those of you from international um, destinations will probably go into Logan and Boston. Uh, we have a lot of great nightlife and shopping and things to do in this area. But of course, you have access to those major cities. And being along the water, we have a lot of waterfront activities as well. And students can really embrace that on campus because we have paddle boards and kayaks you can take out. You can do sailing lessons with our sailing coach. And so we really embrace our waterfront campus. And I'm sure Steve will talk a little bit about some of the things that we're focused on academically from a waterfront standpoint as kind of coastal resilience and thinking about sea level rise and climate change and the School of Architecture is really kind of leading the charge on the types of work that we can do to kind of offset those, um, uh, those impacts to our communities and also support our communities in terms of sea level rise in particular 
Uh, we have a lot of communities in this area, as you can imagine, that are susceptible to what those impacts will be in the next several decades. Uh, so it's things to worry about. So without any further ado, I'm going to pass it over to Steve. And again, if you have any questions, feel free to enter them in the chat. We'll get to them as we can, uh, or we'll wait to the end. And if you have some questions there, we can do that also. So Steve, take it away. Well, thanks. And, and for everybody, thanks uh, to Marcus for uh, putting everything together. And, and you all should know that Marcus is a continuing presence in a great way, uh, looking out for all the graduate students in the university across the board uh, along the way and always available in the transition coming in, but also uh, uh, convening things across the university for all graduate students while you're here. Um, uh, it's great to be with you and it's it's great. Uh, I understand that uh, some of you in, are interested in combinations of architecture preservation and even preservation and law. And that's really exciting, and and I uh, and hopefully you'll you'll find that one of the things we really uh, are excited about is crossovers between one area of focus and the second area of, of special focus or concentration that is available to to you here. Uh, it's a great thing in in general to think that um, on, or a couple for a couple reasons. For one reason is that. Generally, if all of us are good at something and we all have a somebody has a specialty in some area, uh, you have special opportunities related to that that other people aren't aren't qualified in, and so it's a great distinguishing thing to have a second area of specialty. Uh, also, I think uh, if you you found uh, in life that you're you're never none of us hopefully are ever interested in only one thing, and uh, so. The ability, for example, to get a, a dual degree between architecture and preservation or preservation and law, uh, to get a, a degree in either of those areas, but have a grad certificate of four to five courses in urban and regional planning or preservation, or in a new one that's coming along and will, will be available as of fall 22 when you might consider entering, is another one in real estate. Um, so we're, we've uh, created a menu of programs that uh, provide a, uh, the, the, the coherent central degree that, that you need, but special areas that uh, are very valuable and position you well in the, in, the, in the job market and in the leadership market, uh, because we don't want you to just get a job. We're pretty certain uh, most everybody will become leaders in their own ways uh, going forward. And so getting a job is only the first step uh, that's uh, that's coming. And I think Marcus, I, uh, if, you, oh, if you can either advance them or, okay. um, is that okay? Okay. Yeah. Um, so the architecture program is offered on the main campus. Uh, we have uh, for our own students uh, who have done undergrad programs here, you continue on into a one and a half to two year sequence in the master of architecture. Uh, those of you who are here, and I, I believe that's all of all of you who are external, are either path two students who have undergraduate degrees in architecture from other undergrad architecture programs, or if you if you have a background in other areas, then you have a kind of a three year and a summer uh, master of architecture sequence. Uh, we generally have between 95 and 110 overall students in the graduate program. So you come here with a great context of students. And in addition to that, uh, there are usually, say, four to eight preservation students at a time. And um, so you, you have this, um, this amount of context, which is a, in, in a lot of ways, where a, a regular sized architecture program uh, and graduate arena in a relatively smaller university. And so you get the benefits of a, of a great context for a good professional education. Um, next one. And then I'm sure we'll get to the preservation ones in a, in a few minutes. In the, uh, the, the uh, sequences uh, are easy to outline and are available, but basically the components of the architecture degree include uh, design studios, history theory requirements, uh, environment and behavior, Site and including site and landscape design and a, a great course in environmental design research, uh, technical systems practice, and a series of elective op options. And the graduate program in architecture is required to cover all these areas uh, as an accredited program. 
So we're one of the places that you can go. There's about 150 overall in the country where you can receive an accredited degree in architecture. And depending on what your previous background is, if some of you are here, maybe you can let us know in the chat. If some of you are here that have some undergraduate architecture education already, uh, if we then craft an individual outline for you that's likely one and a half to two years or so, uh, or one and a half to two and a half years, depending on uh, how, how complete your undergraduate education was in architecture. Uh, or for the people that are starting as a post-baccalaureate architecture student, then it's it's uh, three years in the summer. Uh, next one. Actually, Steve, before we go forward, if you don't mind, yep. um, I know the last time NAAB was here uh, a year yep. or two ago, if I'm not mistaken, can you yep. speak to, um, they had they had acknowledged a handful of courses that were kind of exceptional. Can you speak to sure. that a little bit? So sure, absolutely. Uh, and uh, this also shows that Marcus and I are a team uh, which is great. So uh, we had our last accreditation in 2018, and we actually had a had a perfect visit. Uh, all of the conditions of accreditation were met, and we received five uh, areas of distinction. One of them was, was in a course called Integrated Project Design, uh, which is where students are required for licensure preparation to put together a complete building, uh, as much as you can do in a semester, but it had to include mechanical, structural, landscape, um, cultural uh, perspectives. Uh, and uh, we received a, a distinctive uh, thing for that when usually that is an area that that, that schools fail in or, or need some more work. Another one uh, was a course called Computer Applications for Professional Practice, uh, which is taught uh, here currently by registered architects from Boston uh, who are alumni, who are in, in, in leading roles in, in advancing uh, building information modeling, BIM, you, which you may have heard of, uh, and um, even simulation. That's really useful in professional practice. That was another area of distinction. Um, other things about strategic planning uh, were, also, were also noted uh, in general. And um, uh, so thanks for, for mentioning that, that Marcus. Yes. Thanks. Um, uh, graduate students have study abroad opportunities uh, either fall or spring semester. You can study abroad in Barcelona. Uh, we, we participate there in a program with students from Clemson uh, and Texas A&M and uh, uh, students who come from a group of 10 Japanese universities. Uh, at any one time, there's about 35 students We've also had opportunities which students have taken up on a more individual basis uh, in Beijing most recently, uh, but also um, in Buenos Aires and in Turkey and um, in Istanbul. So um, uh, architecture uh, and preservation really are global endeavors and undoubtedly almost all of you will be involved in things within and beyond the United States. And so it's a great opportunity uh, to have those opportunities. In addition, in Barcelona, students have the ability to have an internship uh, in the summer following, if you go in the spring, uh, with a Barcelona firm. And there are some great architects in Barcelona. It's a major world city and one of the great centers for architecture uh, currently in the world. Uh, well, Steve, if you don't mind, I'm just going to answer a couple of questions here for folks. Yep. Um, one of the nice things about the study abroad within the MARC program here, so again, it's just for MARC students. They're just doing that one single, singular degree. You can do a semester abroad, and it doesn't set you back. You can still right. stay within your degree plan. Now, if you're a dual degree student where you're pursuing architecture and preservation practices, to do a study abroad in the midst of trying to cram them all in that same condensed time frame is a little bit more challenging, but you can still do <laughs> study abroad. So. It's a nice opportunity that you'll have. And the other thing, and Steve, maybe you can speak to this more specifically, but a number of the studios, there is a few faculty that deliberately pick international projects. And so students right. are developing buildings that are in other cities right. around the world. And oftentimes they go for a limited study abroad experience to really engulf, you know, kind of engage with that project. So right. I don't know if you can speak to maybe Julian's work and some of the others. Sure. So um, in, in, uh, in the integrated project and in, in some others, uh, we have sequentially gone to places including M Mumbai, uh, Portugal, um, uh, 
Switzerland, uh, Montreal, uh, and uh, on a more local level, we, we routinely have had students uh, able to travel fully supported by the school uh, to Philadelphia and Chicago and New York uh, for um, a variety of durations. The, the longer ones are up to a week uh, that we've been able to, to do. And uh, another feature of the MARC program is, is really encouraging students when doing a thesis project uh, to visit the site. And um, uh, often that, that means that uh, that's, that's a, a place in a variety of locations. And so being, being, understanding where you are in, in doing architecture uh, is critically important. And uh, we, we uh, try to help you get there uh, with funding and, and great opportunities. A lot of our faculty also are multilingual. We were just uh, putting some things together and I think 10 out of 20 of our faculty are, are multilingual. Uh, so that gives them entree to go into many of these places uh, as well as uh, helping you get there uh, because they, they have the ability. We have a lot of Spanish speaking faculty. We have some um, uh, uh, French, German, uh, and also um, people who can speak South Asian languages India, Pakistan, things like that. So thanks very much. And so it's great if we do this together, Marcus, because that way, if I, if I miss something, you're right there. I appreciate it. Sure. Uh, no pressure. <laughs> uh, something that you, you can achieve here at Roger Williams that is, is not available to my knowledge at any other place is uh, Samsung has, has given us a major gift to provide each studio desk and all of our conference uh, rooms uh, with screens. And so at your desk, uh, you all uh, have 27 inch monitor with access to a cloud-based server uh, for you to use um, the, what we call the R cloud. And so any software you need is provided by the school for free. Uh, and therefore you can collaborate together because you, you have all the same releases. And um, one of the things we were just checking about just on, on usage, in the whole school of about 450 people. Uh, this semester alone, 330 people have logged into the cloud. And so imagine if 330 people were fighting over a computer lab, that wouldn't, that wouldn't work. And so we're committed to everybody having access to the best things, travel, computing, space, collaboration, lots of other things that'll keep coming up. And uh, we've been providing this and we're just on the verge of even evolving further into a subscription-based computing system, which uh, uh, is exciting that even, even the servers themselves would be hosted by others beyond the university giving first-rate computing. That's what the, the biggest firms do and organizations around the world now. And uh, we always are committed to keeping up with technology because it's critical to keep advancing education. And always with that, your opportunities. The great thing about this too is that there's no additional cost for you as a student. So we're not charging you an extra fee to be able to have our cloud. And there's over a hundred software packages there. So you see some of them there, obviously Revit and Rhino, some of the things that you'll be using in architecture, of course, the Adobe suite, and you can use them anywhere you have access. So you could be at home, even internationally, you could be studying abroad in Barcelona and have access to this. You can have access if you're home on a, on a vacation or a holiday. Um, so it's a really a nice system to have access to all that and it's constantly updated by our IT folks. And they've made significant investment every year, which has been nice to hear because early on when they, as you can imagine, when they unveiled this, it was great. And then all these students wanted to use it and you have a lot of people clogging in. You think of a pipe when you're trying to get people into a system, it gets very busy. Um, but they've invested a lot of money in expanding that pipe and essentially making it a lot more accessible and, and quicker and so on. You can store all of your projects up there, which is great to have access to them. And again, collaborative as, as Steve mentioned. And regrettably, I don't have a photo, but the new the studios have been completely redone this summer. Uh, so we have yeah. brand new studio spaces with all this technology and new team spaces. I don't know if you want to speak to that at all, Steve. I sure. one, of, photo here. one of the things that happened with this is, is even in these photos, you can see there's two people in them. Uh, we, we designed this with the idea that one person, one screen, and they're big enough and uh, that you can look at things together. Well, that's, that's what we all do. We, we, look, we work, we collaborate. And then in addition to, to these individual studio desks, we now have 
18 collaborative sort of meeting spaces in the in the studios around the school uh, where you can have meetings of four to eight people uh, around a large format screen uh, to look at things together or to spread out and build models or at night when less fewer people are around you can spread out further and just there's a there's a back and forth between individual and collaborative spaces that the school has and the cloud computing access is ubiquitous and um, it's it's really something and uh, hope it might seem empowering to you all. Um, another thing that is, is unique to Roger Williams is uh, we have a program called the Teaching Firm in Residence, where we, we have uh, firms, mostly between Boston and New York, who teach graduate level studios uh, to a semester. And um, uh, one of the great things, the idea is that they are outstanding leaders in the field. And so what a great thing that you as graduate students would study with them and then they would hire you. And, uh, and, and by working closely with you for several months in a, in a semester, uh, they know you pretty well. Some of our teaching firms have done remarkable work in, in multiple locations around the world. Um, just on the screen, the, the, some of you may recognize the thing called the bird's nest from the Beijing Olympics, although it was 13 years ago, you may have been uh, in a different situation than you are now. Uh, but obviously, a, a, a World Olympics is a, is a big deal. And so one of our teaching firms was the master planner for that. Our North Campus Residence Hall, uh, some beautiful houses that have won all kinds of awards, uh, notable work in developing countries over on the far left uh, by Mass Design. Uh, there's really some great opportunities. Our current campus master planner is a firm from Baltimore called Ayers St. Gross. And they are, are an ongoing uh, teaching firm who orbits in and out uh, periodically. Um, they're great. They're great firms, but they're they're also committed to teaching. And for those of you uh, who who may not have experienced architecture offices yet, uh, the best ones are have a, a tremendous sense of mentorship. And and that's because if you know there are senior partners and junior people, kind of how you work together and and bring people along, and the younger people inspire things and make new breakthroughs and the older people have to make sure how to whatever their different dynamics are uh, any firm and and any future involves interacting between generations of people and so the teaching firm has really turned out to be a remarkable a remarkable thing and a very friendly um, endeavor it, it introduces you to things that you'd say oh I can't get into that office or or things like that and it's uh, it's really tremendous and you're going to run into, I mean, Steve, would you estimate, I mean, there's how many studios that they're going to be doing here, at least four, depending on their undergrad, right? Yeah, normally they, they, they do four if they were, if you have an undergraduate, a full undergraduate education uh, in, the, in the, otherwise you'd do seven in the, if you're starting architecture now. So um, you would, in, for those of you, when you get to the, the fully, there's, for the, the three-year people, there's kind of three core studios of skills. And then there are uh, two advanced studios, which could be with the teaching firms, graduate studios, and, and then an integrative studio that I mentioned where you put a building together and then everyone completes a, a thesis project. It's a thesis design rather than a, it's also written, but it, it's your own design work of your own choosing. And um, that's the basics of the, of the studio sequence. Yeah, I was just thinking, Steve, you know, just for students to have context around the firms. Um, on average, probably most students are going to have at least two studios, maybe with firms, and the firms are teaching them. And, and that firm is, it's a rotating group of folks, which I think is really neat. You don't have yeah. just one person teaching your class like you would typically have studio. You have a team of people from the firm, and so they might have different people each week, and they have different perspectives. They're working on different projects. They might have a project that's out for bid, and they're asking for your ideas around that. Many yeah. times, students are hired from those studios, so there's a lot of interaction with the firms there, and that's one of the values of having them here is that you're being teach. I mean, this, our faculty are great, so you're going to certainly run into yeah, yeah. that are great there, well, but they can of, also have exposure to the external firms as well. Yeah. Cool. And, and what's great about being a graduate student is you're, you're a younger colleague, but you're still a colleague. And uh, so there's a great community in all of this. And this is a way to, to extend your community to the professional community, which is they're, they're making architecture. And uh, 
pretty exciting. Um, we have a, you know, a lot of alums, you know, uh, we generally have uh, 50 to 60 graduate student graduates a year. Uh, and people go on to do all kinds of things uh, in a variety of kinds of buildings. Um, the orange thing is a not, not famous building, but uh, a sushi bar designed by Carl Dobman, who's now uh, the dean at a, at a architecture school in Michigan and was a professor for many years at the University of Michigan. Uh, the Dow Jones Stock Exchange was renovation with the, the blue and the hexagon sort of shapes was designed uh, by David Burns, who also was the designer for the Chelsea Markets in New York, which you may be familiar with. And um, uh, 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 a major concert hall in Kansas City, the, Kansas, the Kaufman Arts Center, which is about five years old now, was designed by um, uh, Chris Mulvey as part of Safdie Architects in Boston, one of the leading firms in the country with offices in other countries as well. And um, uh, I went to a concert there when my, uh, my sister-in-law lives in, in Kansas City and I, I flew out to see our alums building and, and, and go to the building and things like that. The Seattle Public Library in the far right is, a, is another project by an alum, Natasha Sandmeyer. And uh, Natasha is also an educator. She's a faculty member at SciArc, a leading West Coast school. So the, the graduates of Roger Williams have gone on to do, and these are hint, obviously just a handful and emphasizing projects other than my sushi bar that I like, um, you know, that are kind of notable, you know, to, to do a major concert hall or something for something like the Stock Exchange or major public libraries. Is, and, and, and all that is not just about how, what they've done, but it's really about, again, this gathering community that you're part of, and you're going to do this. Uh, we have some alums now, uh, which may show up here. Um, one of our alums from 10 years ago is, is the head of an office in, in Rwanda, who actually just designed a, a memorial for social justice in Montgomery, Alabama. She graduated in 2011. She's only out of her MARC for 10 years, and she's running the office and designing uh, leading noted social justice recognized and architecturally recognized projects. So uh, uh, talented people likely include include you. You got people have to come from somewhere, and uh, and you go on to have significant careers, which is really hopefully exciting. Um, now these are a host of 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 uh, sort of major major firms who have have hired our, our students and some of some of our students, our alums, uh, since I've been around long enough, I call them students sometimes, so uh, our, our partners in, in these firms. Um, and uh, Many partner with us for lectures as well. I don't know if I'm, I'm trying to remember the company, forgive me, Steve, I'm forgetting, but uh, they had done green roof technology and we've worked with them on sustainability. Yeah, yeah we, have a, we have a whole, uh, a sponsored lecture series on sustainable technology with a roofing company called Tremco, uh, which is actually a world leader in um, green roofs. And also they use a very, it's, it's kind of exciting. Uh, I think often architectural technology is thought of as kind of brute, you know, dirt and, and, and cement and, and uh, you know, not all that skillful in some ways. And Tremco uses pharmaceutical level mixed technology to design its, its uh, roofing and sealants and other things. So architecture technology is, kind of, is really interesting. It's a combination of sort of basic straightforward concrete and framing on one and two story and five story buildings. And there's all kinds of other things that come up particularly as we all need to be more sustainable and people are continuing to innovate um, so there's a, there's a lot of, and, and the, the, most of the expertise for these technological innovations is in the firms. Um, and a lot of the design activity then happens in the schools. Um, but architecture school is not like a, you know, a research department in chemistry or, or physics. Uh, it is, it is some, it is a kind of balancing between uh, full-time faculty and leading external practitioners uh, and the collaboration across uh, teaching and practice. Um, we also are supported by um, 
um, several nonprofit and government partners, including uh, foundations who, who provide support for student projects and, co and courses. And um, um, we, we actually have the, the fourth largest architecture library in New England. And that may sound like maybe that's not a very big deal, but the other three are Harvard, MIT, and Yale architecture libraries. Uh, we're bigger than all the other, I think there's 18, 20 schools in New England now. And um, so we have a major commitment and support for many of our courses and also for our basic resources in library, which includes now uh, hard copy books, but also many digital resources that libraries coordinate. Um, in preservation practices, um, we have kind of like the architecture path one, path two, path three, but that may be the next slide. Um, uh, preservation education here uh, at the undergraduate level, we were the first uh, program in the US to have preservation starting in 1976. Uh, there's, a, there's a range of duration of the program depending on whether you've had an undergraduate education in preservation. Um, and it's like in architecture, it's a balance of classroom and basically meeting scale um, learning situations and literally hands-on in some cases restoration as you see in the, in the, in the, the photograph. Uh, and a lot of field work and, and literally even we, we have a class this semester taught in conjunction with Historic Boston and the Newport Restoration Foundation, where we have four of our basic modules are conducted offsite at their facilities uh, with, with their, their staff. Uh, and um, so we're very committed, as you can tell, to having you be able to learn onsite uh, in a practice situation, which isn't at the detriment of the kind of uh, academic uh, discussion, it's a combination of it. So we go back and forth between on-site and, and seminar scale meetings in preservation and in architecture. And the people in the courses in preservation practices are preservation majors, architecture majors, urban and regional planning, even sometimes construction management students because preservation is a great blending and connector and also a, a connector to many fields of practice, including actually real estate increasing. And um, um, I'll just have one thing, Steve, um, folks that are looking for preservation degrees, you're probably used to seeing an MS or an MA in historic preservation. And um, we, we changed the name of the program a couple of years ago to really reflect not only what we do, but really what kind of jobs you're going to be able to get. Um, the reality of how most preservationists are being hired is they're hiring into architecture firms, engineering firms, um, nonprofits, government organizations, and it's very hands-on in what we do. So as Steve mentioned, there's a balance between the theoretical and practice that we do very well, but we deliberately marry the urban and regional planning, the architecture, the real estate construction pieces of preservation because that's the type of work that you need to get. So we wanted to make sure that, uh, that you would be marketable to those roles when you graduate. So that was a deliberate shift that we made a couple of years ago, and we're seeing that pay dividends for our graduates. Yeah, yeah and we, we actually received a grant from the 1772 Foundation to study preservation and see how to make it as as central as I know I think it is to uh, to the built environment and and the, literally a nationally recognized leader said you know one of the things we found is the word historic in preservation sometimes makes people think that it 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 uh, it limits the engagement so we're not being not historic but we really see preservation as an integral part of preservation literally in terms of legislation or, or conservation, but also preservation is integral to urban and regional planning. It's integral to real estate. It's integral to architectural practice. It's integral to land conservation. And so the preservation and the practices idea is, a, is a, hopefully an exciting distinguishing approach that we've been developing here with, as, as in all the other things, with some of our external partners. Well, one thing Steve will probably speak to as well is the focus on adaptive reuse, which was something that, you know, I'm an outsider, but hearing that and you think about how many projects now are about looking at existing buildings 
and renovating them or changing them into something that's more modern or thinking about being sustainable and use, reusing uh, building materials and not just bulldozing and creating new spaces, um, how important that is. And that's really central to the work that our preservation students are doing. And in that, in adaptive reuse, uh, all the preservation students are required to take a collaborative revitalization studio. And so you all, you all get studio space. You also have dedicated space in the, in the architecture library. Uh, so you, you have an academic home or, or a couple of them, uh, in addition to the studio space, the seminar rooms and the collaborative studio spaces. So hopefully that's exciting. Well, not to belabor that, but I actually had the opportunity during COVID, which one, that's one of the benefits of, of COVID that we had things remote and virtual. And um, Greg had invited me, Greg Laramie, our associate dean, had invited me into the, the critiques for that studio uh, where you had architecture and preservation students uh, presenting their work. And they had a great, and you could speak to it certainly better than I can, Steve, but a great project about the Point neighborhood in Newport. Yep. And that area of town is going to be essentially underwater in a certain amount of time. And so they're thinking about these, what they call contributing properties, historic properties that have been there for, in some cases, hundreds of years. How do we keep them, you know, preserve them the way they need to be without uh, being susceptible to sea level rise? So part of that project was physically lifting those those houses and those buildings, but keeping their historic nature. So the preservation students were thinking about how do we preserve the aesthetic and the contributing nature of those properties. And then the architecture folks were thinking about how do we make it sustainable so that if water had to come through a neighborhood and not wipe out a building, how do we kind of elevate this in a way that's structurally sound and still contributes to the aesthetic of the historic property. It was just fascinating to see how the students came together on a project like that that's so critical to something that's going to be really impacting us um, very soon, unfortunately. So all that work was presented at an international conference in Charleston, South Carolina, hmm. um, called Keeping History Above Water. And all the student work was presented to a host of concerned people. Preservation is, is very broad, sort of small but mighty and far reaching. And um, um, it's, a, it's a, you know, sea level rise, and historic preservation is incredibly important in the US and other places because, I mean, you just think about it for a second and you realize that all the coastal areas around the Northeast and the Gulf Coast are, are colonial. And, and, you know, the major, you know, Boston to Washington or, you know, all around, all the way to Houston and Galveston or New Orleans, it's all historic cores. And those are invariably the lowest lying and the most vulnerable. Uh, also preservation is, is particularly uh, compelling relative to sustainability. Sus you know, preserving existing buildings rather than tearing them down and building new ones. Preserving landscapes contributes to ecological uh, viability increasingly in, in so many different ways. And so, you know, there's gonna be a preservationist who's, who's president uh, hopefully someday pretty soon. Uh, it's incredibly important and it is as much a, a movement as a discipline. It's a very important, uh, compelling uh, scope. And here is a sample of some of the basic uh, coursework. And you can see that we've lit, let, had some ARC and some PLAN courses uh, and preservation is part of those. But one of, one of again, a, I think a relatively unique thing, which I don't quite understand why it's so unique, uh, but we teach you how to analyze architecture. Seems obvious, but you do it in a way and you actually get to or have to learn how to draw a little bit. And that includes a little bit of computing and, and some hand drawing, which is invaluable for all of us to understand what we're working with. Some preservation programs are strictly classroom based or class and field based. Ours are also have a preservation design component as well as an a, uh, an architectural, and there are other architectural history courses that are part of uh, the preservation menu of options. Um, and, um, you know, one of the most popular courses now at the school that we've already, that I've already mentioned is historic construction materials and assemblies. How are, how are significant older buildings built? Well, God, that's fascinating. But it, it isn't only just, you know, what's the mortar like or the stonework. It's like, how does the whole building get put together? What were the aesthetics 
why, how is it that European models or Asian models of buildings were imported into the colonial United States? And how, and if they're still here, how do we, how do we work with them? Uh, there's a material dimension to that. There is also a planning dimension to that. And so preservation education includes, you know, specifics of materials and, and building and, and other form, including landscape. And there is a planning and a, and a financial component too. Um, and uh, there's hopefully a natural that real estate, one of, one of the ways that preservation is funded is through tax credits. And that's all related to real estate value. And so we, we're excited to think that more real estate offerings are part of this. Uh, already there is a project development and finance required in this. So it's a, it's a, it's a great degree program <laughs> if, uh, if I'm not going on too long. And it's, it's very synthetic. Um, um, these are some of, of the, uh, the different directions you can go. And some of these as well are, are areas where architects and architecture graduates get involved as well. And uh, we've always thought, but we were having a little more uh, overlap between the programs in recent years in terms of students being interested. Uh, there is a natural connection and complementary relation between architecture, preservation and planning and real estate, the whole built environment. The next one really should be land conservation as a real area of study. Uh, but maybe that's something you can do in your thesis if you want. There are so many different uh, ways that you can be hired. In some ways people may say to you, it's like, oh, what are you, what are you thinking about doing preservation for? There's no jobs. Hmm. Preservation people go off in so many different directions so quickly from here because it's a relatively rare degree. And it's really incredibly specific and uh, so somebody like Donald Insall Associates in London, for example, they are the, the architects and preservationists for the royal family in, in the UK. And the royal family doesn't just have a few palaces that we hear about periodically, but they actually own property. And that's where a lot of income comes uh, for the royal family. Like the, if any of you have been to London, like Regent Street uh, was named for the regent for the crown and all of that shopping area is literally owned by the Crown. They're called the Crown Properties. So Donald Insull Associates, if you want to look that up, uh, who have taken some of our graduates and interns as well and have visited here in, in uh, various situations, uh, is an incredibly interesting, you know, and you think about it, look at, look at the social history, look at the, the uh, economic reality of real estate in one of the most valuable places in the world. Um, all the heritage properties, there, there couldn't be anything more historic than some of the streets in downtown central London. Uh, it's incredibly exciting. And uh, in another, other areas, you know, the city of, of New Bedford, uh, planning department and the Waterfront Historic League in New Bedford, there's major redevelopment things that are going on all the time. Uh, with all the whaling industry, New Bedford was a really significant American city for a while. And then the whole thing collapsed with the collapse of the whaling industry. And then, so how do you redevelop? Preservation is related to economic development often. Um, you know, there are um, organizations like Preserve Rhode Island and other commissions. Uh, actually, one of our former graduates has been a leader at the New York City Landmarks Commission, and she's coming back for grad school next year. Uh, and um, uh, she's done incredibly important work with one of the most important preservation organizations in the country, one of the most successful. Uh, and uh, there's a whole, there's a host of things. The National Archives and Records Administration, uh, you would work in preservation activities that weren't necessarily related to buildings, but are about preserving American heritage. Um, God, that's cool. Uh, it's, it's really an interesting set of uh, possibilities. Uh, the Community Partnership Center is how we engage external groups in real projects. And so these kind of settings that you can see where people are sitting around tables or presenting is actually the work in progress part with community groups um, and some of the things you work on. So you present on the, on the right to, to planning boards. Actually, the planning board looks like our, our graduate students from a few years ago. And so I guess they're getting grilled by the, somebody in the town 
in a town meeting. God, that's good experience. Um, you know, there are, are other larger in the far left, broad community charrettes where you get together and do strategic planning related to, to architectural projects or preservation projects, planning, et cetera. Uh, it's a great thing. And sometimes they're grant supported. Um, sometimes they're, they're just what we do and we support them from the school. Yeah, I'll just give by one example. Um, you know, I know it's kind of an older example, but the Armory Building here in Bristol, the town didn't have the opportunity or the funding to to be able to develop plans and ideas for how to use the space. And they it was kind of a crumbling building, but it was something that had historical value. So we had a group of historic preservation and architecture students do pro bono work for the town and came up with a plan and they were innovative and in how they use the space. And there were all sorts of crazy ideas. And there was some really fun stuff that they did and ultimately came up with kind of an aqua tourism space, which is what it is now. And uh, that work that they provided allowed the town to then go to state and federal sources and get uh, funding to make the project happen. Otherwise they couldn't have, have done that. So it was our students who really enabled that because they otherwise weren't able to get the architectural plans to get the funding. So it's really nice work. And, yeah. way and so as, as you get toward graduating, you end up having a portfolio of projects that you've worked on in preservation or architecture planning. And so you take the project document that you did in class that as Marcus mentioned, received $800,000 in funding because of that work. And then you, you, uh, you present that or your equivalent project uh, to possible employers or, or to the people you've been educated with uh, who are teaching here. And uh, it's, a, it's a great, you have a substantial uh, set of experience by the time you graduate. Um, a, a career investment program that we have is, is another unique feature that, that uh, received national recognition a couple of years ago. And basically what it is, is that all of our graduate students receive funding from the university to work for nonprofits or firms. Now, we all know that firms should always pay everybody anyway. And in architecture, you're not allowed to volunteer, but they can't, they can't coerce you into that uh, either. Um, but often, if you have a bag of money, uh, when you walk in the door to talk with them, it's a kind of an idea. It's like, oh, I get it. Um, you know, uh, Joe uh, Betancourt or Jeremy Whedon here on the, on the call, or uh, I can't see the other, other names as clearly. Um, you know, you're coming in and, and or we're, we work together to help you get placements. And we tell them that we are supporting their firm and you. Uh, firm or organization for a period of roughly four or five weeks as a startup. And then often you can, if you, if you arrange your funding in a certain way, you can back up one fiscal year to another and get 10 concurrent weeks. But what we found is often the, the firms uh, will use the money we offer in the startup and then they take you on themselves. Um, this has led to hiring all over the country uh, we also have additional opportunities uh, further afield. Um, uh, we have ag uh, agreements that include the ability to sponsor you to work internationally and le all the legal agreements needed to do that. So this is really a tremendous thing and it's, it's uh, in my awareness, unique. There's some people nibbling at a little bit of this kind of idea. But this is a tremendous commitment to your ability to be paid like you should be uh, for work at the graduate level. Yeah, these, um, this award is provided to every student, so it's not something that you have to qualify for in any way. We provide the $3,000 to you annually. It's renewable uh, for each year that you're in the program. And what often students will do is, because of how our fiscal year is structured from July 1st to June 30th, you can actually wait until the summer after your first year, when you get done in May or so, and you'd have that $3,000 available to you from May till the end of June. And then you get another set of $3,000 that starts with the next year. So you could actually use $6,000 in that summer there that essentially is paying you for a little over 300 hours of work with a firm. And that really is such a great door opener, as Steve mentioned, that then many times they, it's no risk. So they can kind of test you out and see if you're a great architect and inevitably they do. And then they hire you and you end up working through the rest of your program and sometimes get hired full time. And, it's great. And because these hours are paid, they count towards your NCARB licensure uh, here at the United States, which is really great. And for those of you who are international students, we, um, you can use CPT 
for that. So you can work with the firm. You don't have to work just on campus because it is a curricular, um, you know, a kind of integrated requirement or at least a piece of your academic experience here. And we're also STEM uh, designated for the architecture program. So you actually get your full three years of OPT with that extension that's provided for STEM designated programs. So there's really a lot of great opportunities for international students here, but this money is also portable. And Steve kind of alluded to that. You could go, if, if you're from another country, you could go back and work at a firm there if you wanted to. If you found a firm you loved in another state or somewhere back home where you're from, you can get paid to work at that firm there. So there's ways to make that happen pretty much anywhere that you'd like. And then in some cases, students, if you get, say you use $3,000 that first year, and a firm picks you up, they decide to pay you beyond that and continue working while you're in school, you're still getting $3,000 from us for your second year. So we wouldn't give that to you on top of what you're doing in the architecture, uh, maybe your, your internship, you could get paid for that, but you could still get that $3,000 on campus. Maybe you'd work with a faculty member on research or a project that they're working on. Um, so you'd still have that money available to you. So throughout your studies, you're gonna have $3,000 annually that's allocated to you at $18 an hour. Uh, that gets paid to you in a bi-weekly paycheck. Uh, we do have an ongoing uh, women's leadership network that was started about nine years ago now uh, through the senior uh, woman in the far in the far left of the screen, Beverly Willis, uh, a New York architect who uh, in uh, uh, being the first architect uh, licensed after the Second World War in, in California. She became very successful there and at other places around the West Coast and then moved to New York. Uh, she's in her early 90s now and, and her main commitment is supporting emerging women. And so we've, we've done many, some trainings with them and established a pretty strong and, and resilient and evolving women's leadership network over the last almost a decade uh, where many uh, uh, alums, but also practicing professional women and allies uh, in a dedicated way, focus on advancing women uh, in the in the challenges that that women face in the in the work environment uh, currently and hopefully in a, in a way that's diminishing, uh, but is is still a reality in in I would say uh, the American workforce at least and. Um, uh, so hopefully this is a, a solid thing. We have a, there's probably about 30 or 35 students at a time who are an ongoing core of the Women's Leadership Network. It's a great thing. And um, so we do have graduate certificates in two areas, uh, but by the time you might enter, if you, if you do, we will have real estate as well. And they can all be completed in our current setup within the elected pool that you have in your programs. Um, and so this doesn't involve additional time. If you may want to do two of them, or as you, some of you may have indicated, you may want to consider a dual degree in preservation and architecture, for example, then that would be a little bit more time um, than a certificate. Um, but in a way, kind of like, you know, a doctor, you know, we all might be MDs, but I'm a, I'm a surgeon and you're a psychiatry expert and somebody else is a pediatrician stuff like that. You know, these, these uh, certificates are, are tremendous complements to your, your core abilities. And, um, and if you can do them at the same time as you are completing your degree, we hope that's a really exciting opportunity. And we found particularly the MR students having that kind of niche or something that adds a little bit more valuable value to you really makes you more marketable when you're going to get one of those jobs. And the value add and getting this without any more tuition or any additional courses is fantastic. So uh, taking, you know, putting my advising hat on, regardless of whatever school you go to, if you can get two credentials for the price of one, yep. that's a good thing. So we really try to make that happen for you here. Yeah. Um, some things about our, our faculty, these are, are uh, our faculty are, are active scholars, practitioners, um, and um, uh, people write books. Uh, Gail Fenske is a leading uh, his, historical expert on the development of skyscrapers. You can see on the bottom, she just gave a lecture last night here in the school. Um, one of our other faculty, Luis Carranza, is the author of Modern Architecture in Latin America with a colleague from UT Austin. That was the first overview of modern architecture in Latin America, which is obviously an important, important book. Um, uh, 
beautifully designed uh, spaces that are award-winning from some of our thesis faculty. Bottom left, Julian Bonder, and the second one from the left, a memorial to the abolition of slavery in France on the top. Um, our Barcelona faculty leader uh, did the, the kind of mid-rise building in the middle of the presentation. Um, so you, you're studying with a, a, a group of faculty who are balancing, you know, kind of scholarly work and reflection with ongoing practice. And, um, and you know, in, universities try to make sure that, that faculty are well qualified and active. I think one of, one of the things that I love the most about the school and, and why I've hung around for a long time is I, I appreciate the community of it. I, I, I really know that we're, we love working with, with you all and, and each succeeding wave of people that are, that are emerging into their, into their futures. Uh, to graduate study, and um, you're one of these colleagues with with these people, and so us showing you their work is is not just to say they're successful, but it's to say that you're they're guiding you, and you're their colleague, and pretty soon you're going to be designing the new Kaufman Arts Center in Kansas City, stuff like that, or or whatever direction you want to take in in your career. Um, so. Um, that's the sense of scholarship and the sense of what faculty do is as, as your, they're senior colleagues of yours, and then they, they just become colleagues over time. Oh, well, Steve, we have one new faculty member, forgive me, I'm forgetting it and I didn't include it here, but he had just sure. published a book and just started. Can you speak to that? I know it was something. Sure. Uh, we actually have two new faculty members. One of them, uh, Ryan Ludwig, um, just came out with a new book published in London called uh, Beyond Sustainability. And it's a, it's a leading look at um, different philosophies of sustainability that might be relevant going forward, given the complexities in, in life and the world. Uh, and um, he's on a speaking tour in general. Um, he, he just joined us after teaching at the University of Cincinnati and Cornell University. And uh, we have one other faculty named Ruben Alcalea, who is a Spanish architect, who has been a visiting professor at Cornell for five years and now has joined us full time. Uh, he's just won a major award for uh, a building he's done in Malaga, Spain, uh, which is being opened by the Minister of the Interior for Spain in, in a few weeks. Uh, so you're studying with, with significant people and, and uh, we'll, we'll keep sharing uh, updates with you and, and hopefully it's exciting uh, for you to think about who you might be studying with. Thanks, Steve. Well, and I'm realizing we've, we've talked a lot, <laughs> which is a good thing. I think we've covered the really important stuff, um, I think, well. So I'll go quickly through the admission process. If, if any of you are interested in applying, I know some of you on the line have already applied, um, but obviously an online application, we're waiving your fee currently. Um, any official transcripts you would send along to us, um, they have to come directly from the school, either electronically or by mail, and we can work with you on that. For international transcripts, please reach out to us. We can talk to you about um, the evaluation and whether you need to pay for an evaluation or if we'll do it here. Um, we try to help students as best as we can, so please reach out. Um, we require two letters of recommendation. They should come from professional sources. They can be faculty, supervisors at work, and so on, just not friends or family. Um, just looking to really kind of get a sense of your design ability in particular, if they can speak to that, uh, but work ethic and your ability to handle graduate level coursework and so on. A uh, personal statement will be uh, required for you just to really give us a sense, one to two pages double spaced on why you want to pursue either preservation practices or architecture or one of the certificates, what you hope to do in the future, what you think you'll contribute to the program and so on. If you're coming for the architecture program, we do require a, a portfolio. We're looking for eight to 10 pieces of work. Most students send them electronically. We do have an opportunity for you in the applicant portal to upload your materials. So we'll make it very easy for you. Um, we are fairly flexible in terms of what you send us. Um, we're looking for you to uh, really demonstrate your creativity, uh, your eye for design. Um, so you could send in you know, pencil drawings, students have done CAD stuff, Photoshop, certainly paint um, or uh, yeah, painted um, kind of artwork. Um, some students have even sent us music, um, things that are creative works of your own that kind of show your creativity is what we're looking for. We can teach you the technicals, but we'd like to see kind of the creativity and the eye for design, um, particularly the aesthetic. Yeah, Steve, sorry. Maybe maybe just a quick one on that. And, and for those of you who may have undergraduate background, 
in architecture already. Clearly, uh, you would likely submit some of the work that would show that you're able to uh, not be at the beginning of a, of a three-year sequence, but at the beginning of a one and a half to two-year sequence, depending on your play, or probably in, pretty much inevitably, it's a two-year design studio sequence. Um, and so if your portfolio is, is relatively brief for admission, for placement, then we would work with you further to clarify. And, and that helps us work out with you, kind of like a transfer student in a way, exactly where your placement is. Um, so just a little extra caveat on that. Yeah. Yeah, thanks, Steve. Um, and those of you that are applying for preservation, we look for an academic writing sample. It's typically a research paper, um, you know, depending on if you've done a literary review or empirical research, whatever you've done, but something that, you know, ideally at least five, you know, eight, 10 pages, um, you know, a research paper that you've done, um, that would give us a sense of your writing ability. That's important. Um, and we always list resume here. It's not required, but certainly if you work with a firm or done any sort of relevant work in preservation or anything, send along a resume if you'd like to. It certainly can only help your application if you've done any work, but it's not a required part of your, of your uh, portfolio or your application. Um, you can apply online on our website. Very straightforward there. Um, transcripts can be mailed to us to the Office of Graduate Admissions. Just make sure it says graduate on it. Uh, personal statements, resumes, even your portfolio can all be uploaded on the portal, or you can email them to us if that's easier. Your recommenders, you'll also input their names and email addresses on the application itself, and they'll get a notification immediately when you submit that part of the application. So make sure they know that it's coming, and they can submit their recommendations there uh, directly in the system. If for some reason they want to mail something or a hard copy, or uh, email it to us directly, they can do that as well. They don't have to use the system if they don't want to. However, it's easiest, but it does have to come directly from the recommender to us. Um, we talked a little bit about the portfolio. Largely, students are using the applicant portal. Just to keep in mind, the portal is available after you submit the application form itself. So sometimes students are waiting to submit because they want to upload things. Just you want to submit the form first, and then you have all of the upload opportunities for all the pieces of your application. So you can upload all of your portfolio materials, resume, and so on. Uh, if for some reason you want to use SlideRoom, you can do that. We have a SlideRoom account. You can upload your SlideRoom there. I believe it's $10 to upload your portfolio. So there is a minor cost to use SlideRoom. Um, you can also mail it to us if you use something that's hard bound. We get a few of those here and there now, but largely most come electronically. Uh, you can also email us. Sometimes students will email us a cloud drive link like Google Drive or something, and that's that's okay as well. So we have a few different application deadlines, and this is true for both the architecture and preservation programs. Uh, the certificates are a little bit more flexible. The first priority deadline, if you're applying for this fall coming up, fall 22, um, is January 15th. What that allows you to do is, uh, if you get in for that first deadline, you get a priority for, for any sort of financial aid that we'll provide to you, scholarships and so on, and uh, give you priority for your classes once class registration opens in typically the third week of March. So architecture is a big program. Uh, many courses are very popular. We have a lot of students from our own program, which I think speaks well of certainly the quality here that many students choose to stay from their undergraduate and the graduate program but they will often jump on those courses as soon as they're available. So the students who apply earlier, if you're an external student, which I think you all are, um, that'll allow us to get you admitted. And ultimately, if you choose to deposit, then you can get registered for your courses. So um, that priority deadline one is the best time to get in. Um, we also have a second deadline on March 1st. Um, doesn't necessarily mean you're treated any differently necessarily, but there's more of a crunch on the timeline in terms of registration. And there may be some less additional aid available to you at that time. The final deadline on May 1st, we largely discourage students from waiting that long because oftentimes classes are full for one, and we may or may not have any aid available at all at that point. So if you want to be prioritized for aid and registration, you want to get in for at least that priority one or two deadline uh, beforehand. We will send uh, for all of our external students, Steve alluded to this a little bit before, especially the architecture students, we have to, well, true of preservation as well. We do kind of a de personalized degree plan for you. So we have to look at the courses you've taken, particularly studios for the architecture students, certainly the preservation students, if there's anything that you've taken, especially if you have a preservation undergraduate degree, they provide some level of advanced standing in the masters, depending on what courses or studios you've taken. So we do take a very individualized approach to create a degree plan for you. That takes a little bit of time. 
Uh, so we will wait to those deadlines to provide all of the students that applied for that deadline. And then Steve and Greg and other faculty will work through the applications and make the decisions. So we typically need about a month um, from that deadline. So if you apply by January 15th, typically February 15th or sooner, we'll have a decision for you. And similar to March 1st and April 1st. Um, so about two to four weeks. Four weeks is fairly typical just because of the degree planning and making sure that we align uh, the curriculum that you need to take. And that's important as you're planning your costs and so on. So quickly on financial aid, um, for American students, you're gonna have the federal loan programs available to you, um, both the federal direct unsubsidized loan and the direct plus loan. Uh, you may have heard of parent plus and undergrad, your parents aren't part of this equation anymore. Um, I'll get to the institutional aid in a second as far as scholarships and things. But many students at the master's level are paying for much of their expenses through federal loans. And because master's students are treated independently, especially if you're a student that's younger and maybe you're just graduating from undergrad, um, you may or may not have support from your parents. Um, so these loans provide the funding that's necessary to get up to the total cost of attendance. Now, we don't necessarily have students that borrow that amount, but and it's a large number, but we provide a cap so that you can borrow money to support your housing expenses, books, meals, other things while you're in school, because it's not just tuition when you're a graduate student, particularly if you're picking up and going across the country or God forbid the world for some of you, um, there's gonna be a lot of expenses related to that. So you have access to the funds to be able to make that work for you. Everybody, that's a, person, that's a personal choice for everyone on whether that works with your financial circumstances, certainly total costs and so on. But the reality is for many graduate students uh, to the master's level, um, federal financial aid is kind of a necessity. Uh, but the good thing is, is that it provides that funding, but also at low interest rates and you have long-term repayment. You have income-based repayment plans as, a, as an option for the federal uh, government. So if you started as, a, as an apprentice or um, uh, what are they calling them, associate architects or um, architecture associates, when they graduate, you might be making, I don't know, 50,000, I'm making up a number. But then as you go further, you might be making 80,000 in five years. So then as you scale, you can actually have payments that are capped based on a percentage of your income. Uh, so those are all available in the federal student loans. So this is the important stuff that everyone wants to hear about. Um, we are fortunate here that every student uh, right now has a 3.0 cumulative GPA on a 4.0 scale. I know some of the international students have different scales. Um, is guaranteed a minimum of a $6,000 scholarship when you come in. Uh, we're in the midst of kind of reworking some of our scholarship opportunities, but we're, we're, our goal is to keep that as a baseline. So if you have a 3.0 or higher, you're gonna be guaranteed at least $6,000 US when you come in. Students that are much higher than that may qualify for additional money on top of that. And this is money that we're providing as an institution in acknowledgement of your academic ability and what we feel like you'll contribute to not only the university, but to the architecture profession or preservation profession. So we have some scholarships available, but again, those priority deadlines are gonna matter. So that first priority deadline, they're gonna really get top consideration for any aid that we might be able to provide. And then that may, may scale back over time. Uh, but we are offering some additional funding this year for students who are particularly academically uh, strong. And that includes preservation practices as well. Now, regardless of your GPA, as I mentioned before, the $3,000 in the Career Investment Program is provided to everyone. And that's not money off your bill, that's a bi-weekly paycheck. So that's money while you're working in a firm or working on campus through the Career Investment Program, and you're getting money in your pocket. So it's nice to have a little extra cash to support you on meals and other things. Uh, going out in the local area and so on. We also have some limited internal scholarships that once you're a student, you can apply for. Uh, they are very competitive, uh, but they're awarded each year to top students here. We're also very closely aligned with AIA Rhode Island. They actually are based on our Providence campus and we have a very good relationship with them. And I think they have eight scholarships a year and five or six of them go to our students pretty regularly. So there's some good opportunities through the Rhode Island chapter of AIA, of course, nationally uh, as well. Um, so we'll really try to encourage students to apply for those as additional opportunities because we know uh, architecture um, education is not inexpensive, um, but fortunately we're right in the middle of the pack. We're not the most expensive schools, but we're not the least expensive, um, but we're very committed to the quality and the value that you get for the money that you spend with us. And just kind of final thoughts as far as you know, student life, we have our, of course, our recreation center, we have our dining commons, our dining is nationally recognized for quality and uh, students love it here. Uh, we have one of the most active and largest AIS 
AIAS chapters in the country. That's American Institute of Architectural Students. Um, we go to the national forum every year over New Year's, and then there's a grassroots conference, a few others that students participate in. Uh, we've also been to, this was a Northeast Quad, a very old picture of me, uh, with a few of our um, former students who went down to um, Falling Water outside of Pittsburgh. Uh, it's a Frank Lloyd Wright property, I'm sure many of you know. Uh, so we sponsored a trip there and, you know, we've been very engaged. Our students really get a lot of opportunity, not only with what, what Steve talked about in terms of connecting with firms, both in the firms and residents, uh, and also out in, in your internships, the career investment program and research and things, also your study abroad, but also participating in these regional and national and even international conferences that are often funded, at least in part, if not fully, uh, for you so that you're not paying out of pocket to be able to go to these things. And then on top of all of that, um, our graduate students the last couple of years have been able to engage more broadly beyond their programs because we have a graduate student association uh, and we're doing activities throughout the area. We've gone up to Boston Red Sox games. We've gone to some Broadway shows. We're actually going to see Hamilton for those who are familiar with the Broadway show that's just internationally acclaimed. We're going uh, next week, actually. Uh, we're taking 70 students uh, to Providence to see the touring version of Hamilton. So we're excited for that. Um, Steve mentioned there's a lot of networking and uh, professional lectures and things that we do. There's, of course, the paddleboard and kayaks I mentioned. So we really try to get you to embrace your life as an architecture student, but also as a graduate student as part of the Roger Williams community here and really embrace our location in Boston and New York and New England. And just there's so many great things here. And we want you to take full advantage of that. And we try to bring that kind of to your doorstep and make it an opportunity for you. Um, you know, anytime that you'd like to do that. So we're really excited about all the opportunities the students have been able to take advantage of. And certainly now with COVID kind of behind us, at least we're able to be on campus a little bit more than we were. We're able to do more of these activities that we previously, um, at least last year, hadn't been able to do. Uh, please connect with us online. Uh, I think one of the best resources is if you go on to the AIAS RWU Instagram account, they post a lot about the student experience here as an architecture student. So you can see some events and the things that they do there and the fun that they have. They just some fundraising and things. Uh, it's not uncommon to see a t-shirt or two with Steve and Greg's face on it. They always do some fun stuff um, to really kind of embrace the community. And, and I love how Steve and Greg go right along with it. It's really just a fun part of uh, being a student here. So it's a really engaging community. I hope you'll see that uh, through the social media and other things. So uh, with that said, you have, have our direct contact information here. If you have any questions, we're happy to answer them for you throughout um, either you know tonight or later on. But i uh, love to. I know we went a little bit long and nearly all of you have stuck around for the entire time. So we really appreciate that. Um, can we answer any questions? Uh, please feel free to unmute if you'd like, or you can ask your questions in the chat box. Um, we covered a lot of ground. Hopefully that was good for you. It was all right. We're glad to meet you. Let's see. I always wonder if people are asleep or if we covered too much. Ah. <laughs> Yeah, thank you for being here. We appreciate that. We will post this as well. I'm, I'm recording this session. Uh, we'll post it uh, to our website and we'll make it available to all of you if there's anything you need to reference uh, later on. Um, but any questions we could, or anything we might have missed? And thank you, Joe. Glad that, glad that it was, I thought it was informative. Um, I guess if any of you haven't haven't visited, we'd be happy to have you here too, and um, meet other students, meet faculty, meet us. And things like that. Yeah, Steve, thanks for mentioning that. Actually, um, we are are now doing travel grants for students. So if you are interested in coming and visiting us, and there seems to be a lot more interest once you're admitted, and then you know come in the spring as you're deciding on schools and so on. If you come out to us and you ultimately decide to enroll. Um, we'll provide up to a $500 credit on your fall bill uh, as kind of acknowledgement of the travel expenses that you have. But, um, so that's something we've offered to students across a number of programs. But one thing that will be unique for architecture and preservation is we're looking at potentially having an accepted student event likely in March or April. Um, I know for international students, it might be harder for you to get here, but for the, for the domestic students, um, that we may provide uh, hotel coverage for you, uh, some sort of direct financial benefit. Likely we'll pay your hotel when you come uh, to us. And we have a great local hotel here uh, in Bristol, right on the water. 
uh, that students always kind of like because they can experience the town a little bit. But we'll pay your hotel if you come to that event. So keep an eye on your emails. And if you decide that you apply and ultimately are admitted, uh, we'll make that available to you. So um, that's pretty rare, I think, in the master's programs. I could be wrong. I think there are some you know, more um, kind of selective programs that might fly out a few students. Um, we'd love to do that eventually. Uh, but at least for all of you, we're going to, for the first time, allow um, some sort of hotel stipend that will cover for you so that you can come and make that a little bit more accessible uh, if you come in the spring. So keep an eye out for that. Thanks for coming. We're, we're glad to, to meet you here. Uh, appreciate it. Thanks so much, Marcus. Yeah, thank you, Steve. Appreciate it. Thanks, everybody, for coming. And uh, we'll be in touch. So thanks again. Happy holidays to those of you celebrating. Take care.